Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome in the auditorium at the Rijksacademy. It's a bit uh, full and warm. It will be cooler soon. I understood. Um, welcome at the second uh, edition of the um, uh, public series uh, Stedelijk at Rijksacademy. It's the first time we have a conversation uh, happening tonight by uh, Andy Hope, artist from Andy Hope 1930, artist from, uh, from Germany based in Berlin, and John Welshman, uh, art historian and writer. Uh, John is uh, professor of art history at the University of, of California, San Diego, and he is advisor at the Rijksacademie. And Andy Hope is our guest for uh, today. John is going to speak about uh, the recent work of, uh, of Andy Hope, who is at the moment having shows at Hauser & Wiert uh, Gallery in London, and also at the, um, what was the name, I always forget, the um, uh, Kessner Gesellschaft in Hannover. And John was uh, writing one of the main essays in the catalogue for this uh, exhibition. So he's an expert. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, ask you all to turn off your phone, of course. And um, I also would like to thank Menno and Hendrik of the Stedelijk for the collaboration. And uh, there will be more to follow. John, can I give you the word? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, is that the mic's okay? Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Martanje. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be, be here this evening. Uh, I have to say I have a little bit of a cold, so um, my talk may be punctuated with a few sneezes and tissue breaks, uh, but please bear with me. I'll do my best to, to keep those to a minimum. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to be a part of this series uh, as the Stedlich, which um, happily will be opening in September, has reached out to uh, a number of local institutions, including the Reichsakademie. Um, I saw yesterday the auditoria at the new Stedelijk, and uh, I think we're all going to be looking forward to uh, events uh, switching venues and the exchange going the other way in the, in the coming years. That uh, Those uh, two auditoria that I saw looked absolutely wonderful, very exciting, very intimate, um, and I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of uh, exciting uh, events uh, ahead when the museum is open. So tonight... Um, uh, what we're going to do is, is quite simple. I'm going to make a few remarks um, drawn from uh, one of uh, several projects that I've done with uh, Andy over the last couple of years. Um, I'm really just going to touch on one re even really quite small aspect of his work. Um, and, I, and I did that deliberately just so that maybe I can focus on it and give it a little bit of depth and bring it out. Um, but when I first uh, met Andy, in fact, Ironically, we, we never physically met until yesterday. It's a very odd thing, but we, we had a virtual relationship <laughs> uh, for, uh, for many years. No, we, we entirely were emailing and Skyping and exchanging in, in that way. Uh, and, and this yesterday, when, when Andy arrived uh, here, was the first time I'd actually set eyes on him. So uh, it's, it's lucky it all went well, and we still decided to, uh, to do this event. Um, but no, when I first uh, um, looked at Andy's work, I was really struck by the complexity and the multi-layered uh, approach that he was making uh, to, his, uh, to his use of uh, imagery and the way that he was generating effects around um, a kind of shared unconsciousness routed, as we were discussing earlier this evening, through a kind of popular imaginary. Um, and uh, as I started to work on Andy's uh, um, paintings and installations and sculptures, uh, I realized that really the, the number of layers that you had to peel off to work through uh, the imagery, to work through the iconography, to try and understand the mechanisms uh, uh, around how, how his work was, uh, was functioning were, were, were extremely um, uh, profound and, uh, and quite actually difficult to access. So that's really why I'm just going to isolate one uh, really quite small um, aspect of the work. Um, maybe we could have the lights down. I might as well, yeah, because then you can see the image more, more clearly. I have a light here. Okay. By focusing his work on the gargantuan multiverse of heroes and villains, exotic landscapes and distant cosmologies, 
signs and symbols, pasts and futures that have been engendered during the last century by the science fiction and comic book genres, Andy Hope has taken up with what is probably the most extensive and self-perpetuating system of iconography ever devised. His address to the details elusively subtended by this tradition is, however, clearly different in kind, extent, and purpose from the work of several American artists who've moved through some of the same terrain. Mike Kelly, for example, <laughs> offers impressionable extrapolations from the imagined cityscape of Candor, the city of Superman's birth, which constitutes one of the shifting contexts for the adventures of what is probably the best known of the American superheroes. What you're looking at on screen is Superman reciting selections from The Bell Jar and other works by Sylvia Plath, a video still from 1990, um, with a wider view of the exhibition Candor Con from 1999. In a very different style, the drawings and zines of Raymond Pettibone pose an ironic re-arbitration of the legacies of graphic populism and its image text relationships. I'm showing you on screen Infinite Expansion, which is a Mike Kelly work from 1983 with Pettibon's as if the most important point in the world, dot, dot, dot. Back to Kelly. This is from his Candor's show um, at the Ablonka Gallery in Berlin in 2007. And this is Pettibon's uh, Superman on the left with uh, Hope's Circus City on the right, and a couple of Batmans by Hope and Pettibon. Hope on the left and Pettibon on the right. This is uh, Pettibon's Untitled on the right-hand side, um, and um, uh, uh, one of the uh, images with Batman in it, one of the many Batman and Robin pairings that Hope has produced um, on the left. And this one, Vavoom, with the support of a formidable body of German philosophy, which I put up just to make Andy a bit nervous about, <laughs> about how things can develop a little later on. Sorry, sorry for that one. Um, uh, and then uh, that, that's obviously Raymond Pettibon's work um, uh, on, on the left, and then a couple of works by uh, by Andy that uh, that uh, engage with this you know extreme pointed rocky landscape um, with uh, different orders of figure. Now, while Pettibon, like Hope, I think to some extent in this respect, gives us a sense that his work could venture almost anywhere, skewering romantic relations, surf culture. Um, religious or occult practices and general credulity. Both he and Kelly manage their scoring of appropriation and invention without the superabundance and maybe even the ineffability of referential possibilities negotiated or alluded to by hope. So I want this evening to concentrate just on one mode of reference and allusion, though one I think that's key to Hope's practice and opens out onto a range of other issues. This is the question of language itself, alphabetic and visual. Hope's tendency is to reduce the concision, actionist pragmatism and rhetorical conventions of the linguistic quotient of the comic strip so that in many of his works the title of the image, usually a single short sentence or phrase, is inscribed at the top or elsewhere of the image. The artist rarely takes up with what emerged as the normative devices for the capture of language in these genres, the speech and thought bubbles that drive the narrative forward in the popular traditions. Where he does, as in Forbidden Worlds, here on the right, um, with its uh, original, in quotes, uh, on the left, where he does, as in this piece, he alters and reduces what might be regarded as the more dated usages of the early eras. Here, 
the bubble bearing what is effectively a subtitle for the issue is changed from chilling tales of the eerie unknown in that original to the sparer and more declarative the unknown in the hope rendition. Having no special use for the commercial or iterative functions um, that they somehow generate in addition, he also eliminates the other text that appeared on the original cover, giant 52-page issue by no less exploring the supernatural. So one of the most significant of the particular effects that Hope brings to his own language of graphic forms is a signature deployment of calligraphic script. This eventuates in several related idioms. The first is a loose, often irregular, cursive style in which he signs and dates the authorship of the majority of his works, Andy Hope, 1930, a name that he's now adopted as his own. With some modifications of scale and inflection, this style is sometimes carried over into other forms of inscription, including the title text, or um, as in this work, X in furnace, um, an oil on board, which as you can see is also features a row of arrow-like or text-like arrows, or in this example, winter heat, imaginary with JWG from 2006, where the title and subtitle are separated by the signature and date, which all appear at the top. And I'm showing this work with Mike Keller's Pay for Your Pleasure in its Chicago exhibition, where it was accompanied by artwork from the local mass murderer, John Wayne Gacy, the JWG of Pope's subtitle. In other works, such as A Abstraction, this one from 2005, title and signature appear uh, at the bottom um, with the defining uh, alphabetic uh, uh, A uh, at the top. In others still, such as Silence or Death from 2003, writing appears on both the top and the bottom registers, while in Eye of Tomorrow, on the left here, um, we can see um, that uh, the script ranges from a kind of quasi-illegible spidery looseness, often referred to as doctor's script, to a relatively readable workaday hand. And in this dimension of writing seems to bear some form of understated privilege by virtue of its closeness to the selfhood of the albeit pseudonymous artist. Now, a second idiom arrives in the double-struck or blocky capitalization that supplies the headline or title texts of many works, such as Death World from 2005. A dedicated version of this style, which you're looking at on screen, is reserved for the tiki-themed works, such as this one, Weird Tiki Abstraction from 2004, or, um, I'm sorry, actually, this is a pencil work from the six-part tiki block, right, from 2005. So um, that's the image you're looking at. And as with the calligraphic text, the capital strata are rendered in a range of variants, including double lineation and more loopy forms that arise, as here, out of the meshy haze of white brush marks above the heads of the two protagonists of this work, Cryonics, from 2005. A third stratum of calligraphic in inscription is um, generally marked in capitals with spiky stilt-like extensions, reminiscent of the graphics associated with the early punk movement or aspects of Gothic or heavy metal lettering. They're not quite identical to either. And I'm showing you two uh, Hope works um, flanked, uh, or which flank um, in the middle here, an early cover of Punk magazine, which was first published in 1976 and dedicated to the Ramones. This prickly style is used for a variety of inscriptions, including the title terms written onto, to, onto Hope's two painted sculptures, Eye on the Sky, uh, 2006, uh, no, 2002 to 2006, and this one, X Abstraction, from, two th from the same years, 2002 to 2006. And I just, I really don't have a lot of time to go into the detail, um, but these are all moments, um, actually some very early works. These are works um, from 1977 to 78, the Mike Kelly uh, words themselves um, and the loose doodle in which the text and the self-naming has degenerated. Um, and then the 
uh, the sort of heavy Gothic evil lettering uh, on the right-hand screen comes from the project Australiana from 1984 with one of the um, acrylic paintings um, in the middle, just to give you a sense of the uh, variety of uh, calligraphic and lettering styles that Mike also took on. So added to these um, calligraphic styles is a wide variety of para-alphabetical symbols, numerals, acronyms, logos, and devices, including many adapted directly from hope sources, such as, you know, perhaps most obviously, the S for Superman in the badge um, featured in this work, the same spot for 2,500 years night, uh, from 2007, or the spread-eagled winged uh, or the spread, spread winged bat emblem, which features um, in other numerous works. Some of these additions relate to the artist's own initials, A H, um, as here. Some are the product of immediate associations that arise during the compositional uh, process. Um, and this is a, a case in point. Um, this image, the life of A H from 2005, um, which is inscribed with. Uh, what the artist describes as a strange E whose origin and signification he cannot account for. Well, we'll see if, that's, see if he remembers in a minute uh, about that. While others bear, um, I think, more considered but still often cryptic meanings, as in um, this image, 4, 2006, with the number 4 inscribed on a blue bat-like motif underneath a green head with yellowish eyes, which refers to Jack Kirby's the Fantastic Four, with the original blue of their suits transferred, if you like, psychochromatically over to the bat. Several works uh, are marked with the talismanic numerological futurism encoded in the date 4419, which inverts the tragic high point of the Second World War, 1944. The date also suggests an extension forward in time by the same span of years that separates us from Socrates and the dawn of Western civilization, which Hope addresses in his 2008 exhibition, City of Socrates, at the Baudak Gallery in Berlin in that year. Now, Hope's symbols arrive with a special intensity around the year 2000, I think, when he began to sign his works using a range of inscribed formulae, letters, and emblems, including dead Jesus, Nova, Dreamer, Psychic, Alchemy, Yilla, and V, the letter V, as in this work, V, People, uh, from 2007, if I remember correctly. The wall size piece De uh, Demon Nova Dreamer from 2004 presents a special case as it's marked with a variety of sub signatures and in fact I think constitutes a commentary on the assemblage and overlap of these designations. Now some of Hope's signatures and titles recall usages by figures from the historical avant-garde um, and that would most obviously I think refer to Giacomo Mbala um, who uh, signed himself uh, Futur Bala from around uh, 1913, and I've put one of those uh, early pieces of Bala on the right. It's uh, uh, Vortex from 1914, an oil on paper, along with Hope's uh, Futur from 2005. Others open up wider frames of reference, such as the V, um, uh, which is proffered in part as a homage to Thomas Pynchon's debut novel pub of the same title, V, published in 1963. Uh, Hope clearly sh shares with Pynchon, I think, a capacity to layer profligate imaginative projections over a polyvalent infrastructure studded with historical and popular cultural references. In both instances, what is speculative or dreamlike, writerly or pictorial, is never defeated by the negative sublimes of gratuitous overabundance or self-conscious obscurity. And I'm actually, you're actually looking at a work that doesn't directly relate to that. I've just put up a couple of works um, that relate uh, this graphic uh, inscription tendency back to futurism. So the Bala work on the left, a kind of sound poem 
um, uh, with uh, Star Kings from 2005 on the right. So one of the most iterated of Hope's symbols is the artist's emblematic after-signature mark using what is termed in heraldry a cross-crosslet, or cross with the ends of each arms in turn crossed. On screen here is um, one of the parts, a part of a group of 20 works on paper collectively titled This Island Earth from 2006. The distortions, recalibrations, and juxtapositions of these symbols produce an immensely complex re referential feel, which allows individual pieces to be associated with others bearing variants of the same device in a never-ending matrix of semantic clusters. This formatting of association resembles the interconnected embeddedness and symbolic exfoliation of the comics universe itself. To take this example a little further, maybe, the cross crosslet signature, um, composed of four Latin crosses arranged at right angles to each other with their tops pointing north, south, east, and west, has long been held to signify the missionary outreach of the Christian church, hence its alternative designation as the mission cross. Hope appears, therefore, to have taken up with his own ironic deployment of evangelical dispersion, even though several pieces also bear the anti but also descriptive Christian logo of a skull surmounting the dead Jesus, or the motto, dead Jesus. Now, Hope subjects this heritage to a new kind of spectrum analysis, literally in one of the 23 works taken from his 2004 sketchbook inscribed, The Sun is Shining, The Rainbow Man. What results is an artistic compendium that functions like an engorged alternative apocrypha in which Christian symbolism occupies just a fraction of its symbolic energy as its signs and symbols are intermeshed with the allegorical adventures of Mesozoic megafauna, solar cosmologies, facets of Greek civilization, multiple genres and characters from science fiction and fantasy, historical events in the mid and later 20th century, and a myriad other, quote, strange, amazing, weird, unusual, or unexpected tales, each with its own elaborate pantheon of potentates, superheroes, criminals, and monsters, and each set out in an intricate iconographic topography. Hope creates, if you like, a dissident parallel universe that embraces the galactic reach of science fiction and comic book cosmologies, but musters its response in another dimension. Hope's regimen of distinctive, recurrent, handwritten linguistic marks and symbolic notations answers quite directly to the signature styles of the comics universe in its golden and silver ages. Here, too, all text was written in by hand. Rather than employing typographic or font-based models, comic book letrists, in general, based their inscriptive technique on the studied neutrality of mechanical drawing. It was not until around 1990, shortly after the dawn of the mass computer age, that comics began to use regularized topography of any kind, interestingly enough. What Hope rejects in the linguistic and graphic traditions of the comic strip is, of course, as important as what he appropriates and reformats. He completely eschews, for example, the repertoire of sound effects emotive and motion indicators, and shorthand mood-seeking abbreviations so prominent in, in the publications of the 1950s and 60s, and deliciously parodied using witty neologisms such as squeens, grawlixes, and agitrons by Mort Walker in the lexicon of Comicana. By rejecting some of the most notable mannerisms used in comics, Hope promotes the stillness and uncanny equilibrium of his images, which are purged of the restless flow and action-driven momentum of his sources. He turns his back equally, we could say, on the search by artists, 
beginning with the speed and light lines of the futurists and Marcel Duchamp's rotational arrows and dotted passages for causal marks that connect the space of the image or object with temporal sequence. Or, to be more accurate, he takes on these relationships, but in another dimension. Even when Hope spells out a more citational relation to the historical comic books, or the historical sequence of comic books, he does so by turning language back on itself in order to reveal its potential to arise from and return to a chain of variants that lead to empty signification. A good example is found in Fing Fang Foom from 2004, where we are shuttled between the linguistic caprice responsible for the naming of this character and a perverse labyrinth of racialized abstraction. The artist's recursive relation to language begins with the titular inscription, for here the punkish ethos of his spiky calligraphy seems to catch hold of some involuntary plastic reanimation in the letters themselves in order to emerge as vaguely orientalizing. Now, Fing Fang Foom refers, of course, to the 32-foot-tall, dragon-like, extraterrestrial former chef and purveyor of destruction from Karakanthra, created by Stan Lee, who first appeared in Strange Tales number 89 in 1961 and continued his adventures in Iron Man, Marvel Monsters, and Astonishing Tales thereafter. While stubbornly enduring, even after his own capture and death in one episode, the scaly creature was subject to several linguistic subterfuges of his own, including an extended episode, extended episode of muteness during his appearance in Astonishing Tales, which led to speculation from some devotees that Foom was actually impersonated in this incarnation. Most tellingly of all, or most telling of all, however, is Lee's own account of the derivation of Foom's name from the title of the film, Chu Chin Chao, from 1934. Based on little more than loose association and onomatopoetic alliteration, the whimsy of this origin is further underlined in the genealogy of the film, which was based on an earlier musical comedy that derived in turn from the well-known adventure Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. Arising from this orientalizing elision of Middle Eastern and Chinese fabulism, it's not surprising that Foom's journey through the comics universe was subject to analogous rounds of vagary, revision, and speculative analogy. Caught up in these vicissitudes is a negative version of the semantic mesh sought for by hope as he shuttles between historical reference, pre-history, and speculative futurism on the one hand, and between illusion, revision, and metaphor on the other. Foom's shifts between alien and human, dragon and navigator, silence and loquaciousness, violent avenger and soporific captive, and his weave in and out of both human and alien history, and the pantheon of comic books, heroes, and villains offer another set of counter-rationalist axioms for the deliberation on fate and destiny, space and time, war and peace, which is also taken on by hope. Now, one of the effects of hope's interventions of these kinds is to concentrate and crystallize the promiscuous effusions of popular graphic publication. He arrogates to himself, for example, each of the professional tasks that organized and defined comics books production in its heyday in the 1950s and 60s, taking on and overlaying the roles of the artist or penciler, writist, letterist, colorist, or inker, editor, and publisher. Now, these categories answer quite precisely, in fact, to the materials used for his work, in which color is applied using oil and acrylic paint and gouache, monochromatic marks, including letters and symbols, which are made with pencil, pen, and felt tips, while the artist himself takes particular care 
to manage the organization, arrangement, and distribution of the works in an editorial manner, which also includes the provision of new presentational formats, such as the wallpaper of images, which acts as a ground for hanging works, which we saw at the beginning of the talk. If one of Hope's modes of concentration is brokered through the provision of delirious excess, others follow on more consequentially from the artist's dialogic relation to the popular traditions that he vampirically remasters. One of the most iterated of the blanket definitions supplied for the adventure and science fiction idioms as a whole, for example, suggests that the primary features shared by these comic book genres include commitments to narrative, sequentiality, and serial publication. By virtue of his work with the singular image, Hope, of course, is bound, to some extent at least, to eschew the storyboard sequence, even though his work as a whole redeems some aspects of its narrative signification through the use of collage, the creation of multi-part works, and what we've already noted are the editorializing effects of installational groupings. Working against the grain of the comic's prototype, he concentrates on what we can term the para-narrative suggestions for which he strives by making or uh, organizing these into the singularity of an individual frame, or in the parlance of comics, a sequence of unknowably matched solitary panes. Denied fundamental aspects of the sustaining logic of befores, durings, and afters, that guide the comic strip through weeks, sometimes months, often years of careful development, Hope's production falls back on techniques of displacement, substitution, and condensation, not dissimilar, perhaps, to the constituents of the dream work outlined in the famous sixth chapter of Sigmund Freud's Interpretation of Dreams from 1899, which are themselves premonitions of the visual and textual avant-garde experimentalism of Dada and surrealist artists in the later 1910s and 20s. While nourished by a hidden logic of symbolism, visible only in the paradigm of his total production, a single work by Hope negotiates any number of consequentially short-circuited intimations, functioning in this sense like a, ghosted, a ghostly arrested verso to the recto of serial publication. Almost everything in a hope image contributes to its uncanny lack of focus and mesmerically opaque abbreviation. Text, for example, as we've already seen, seldom signifies as dialogue, stage direction, or even thought bubble inference, though it is sometimes closest to the latter. Managed instead through several registers, including title, subtitle, label, commentary, and signature, it signposts a set of covert appositional relations and out-of-frame declarations that, that are rarely underlined by the forms and figures it would appear to annotate. In some instances, as we've seen, the grip of language on the signifying transparency uh, thus resolved is relaxed to a kind of a point of dissolution. In Tan Hofferbin from 2005, for example, we witness a compound neologism that layers references to Richard Wagner's opera Tannhauser, 1845, with intimations of Blade Runner, the famous film by Ridley Scott, um, made in 1982, colliding both of these with a dose of post-existential self-assertion. Hoffer Bin combines the artist's name, or his former name, with the German Bin, or I am. At the same time, many of Hope's figures, objects, and landscapes are sketchy, reduced, and imprecise. Most of the faces he renders are denied the kind of expressive centrality accorded to them in the comic book tradition, where they punctuate the delivery of forward-moving action and are instead scratched out, replaced by an array of other part objects or mask-like superimpositions, or simply smeared into neutrality or oblivion. The first drawing of the 2004 sketchbook seems to allegorize both the artist's general restraint or withdrawal and this physiognomic 
diminuendo, taking the form of a line drawing done without removing the pen from the page. It appears to represent a cowboy type with distended, upraised arms posed in the surrender position, surrounded by a doodled desert flora. While the simplified linear style of what surrounds it already prefigures a lack of particularizing specificity, the protagonist's face is obliterated by an iconoclastic flurry of horizontal scribbled lines, mixed and matched with the more vertical slashes standing in for the long hair that cascades from under a tall western cum witch's hat. Underneath this scene, the artist has written three lines of text gathered into a single proclamation by a set of fancifully curled brackets which converge on the word stay, fo followed by Hope's standard signature, Andy Hope 1930. Already in itself, a remarkably polyvalent signifier with its connotations of steadying, stopping, and supporting, the unstable governance of this image by various stays is underlined in the triple inscription, which you can read at the bottom, hopefully. Stay behind this lines. Stay behind writing. Stay behind yourself. This is a hope haiku form manifesto of prescient constraint, a willful admonition addressed to self, viewer, and image, counseling all to maintain their positions behind three privileged points of origin, behind lines, which in this connection means the marks that make up the image, but also perhaps battle lines, song lines, and border lines. Behind writing, another way of making lines, but here withholding meaning or inside or before the commitment to alphabetic form. And thirdly, behind the constitutional selfhood of the viewer or reader, artist or addressee. Instead then of Hope's work conjuring up readings staged between the lines, as we might be led to expect by virtue of its cascade of elusive suggestions, we are party to a generalized behindness or withholding that takes its place in the lineage of modern systems of constraining, from Marcel Duchamp's standard stoppages to the dawn of non-iconic abstractions, to minimalist reductionism and Matthew Barney's serial drawing restraints. restraints. Now finally, Hope's relentless capacity for abbreviation comes at us, I think, from other directions, including those generated with, it, with his media and materials. Many works feature intense doses of dislocating formal surplus, willfully supplied by the artist to pictorial surfaces, which they often dominate. Ragged swathes of sketchy color, blurry patches of monochrome infill, outcrops of hatching or edging, and doodle-like repetitions. Allied to the regimen of childlike simplifications and disarming standardizations that hope applies to mountains, houses, landscapes, and space itself, the primary effect of this intemperate matrix of marks is to act as a formalized cloud of unknowing, the sum of whose parts often adds up to nothing less than an overall indecipherability. The implications of this undercoding sometimes find their way back into language. The delivery of the viewer into the fallacy of superficial appearances, coupled with an ongoing referential retreat, is announced quite directly in this work, Silence or Death, from 2003, and underlined again in a work from Block to Bad from 2005, whose inscribed text equivocates between an interrogation questing for truth and the everlasting loss of sight. Ask for your true voice, forever blind. This final gesture of restraint takes us to the heart of Hope's project and the dialogues with history, truth, and impossibility on which it's based, reliant on neither the privileged veracities of selfhood, nor on vainglorious social promises of knowledge and vision. Hope 
navigates between allegory and fiction, silence and language, symbol and emblem, fate and randomness, in order to suggest the tragic but ultimately enlightening interdependence of past and future on a phantom plane in which imagination somehow meets responsibility. Thanks. I'm just going to get yours up, Andy. That one, right? Yes. Thanks, John. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks for coming. Um, I want to start with um, my um, a, a little bit about my name, or about this the, 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 the ge genesis of Andy Hope 1930. And I want to speak a little bit about the, the identity and authorship. And then I come to the paragraph appropriation, and then I want to speak a little bit about audience. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Arthur Craven. Um, for me, it was a very important person at this time. So when I studied uh, uh, in, in London, uh, I did a, I did a, a show um, uh, installation or a, or a setting uh, with several cutouts of was important for me by in a biographic biographical way and also by influences and one of them what had a strong influence was Arthur Craven uh, called also like a could also seen as a father of a kind of a father figure for data artists or or a first uh, good uh, uh, example of take uh, art as an adventure or a kind of model of adventure and I ha had this image in my, in my setting of him. And also I had this, I mean, this are all st early stu student works, um, had this, uh, this uh, sailboard. And I took over his, his kind of approach and, my, and, and, and do an interpretation on, on his own practice into my practice. I, and this was a kind of translation. So he, he was a kind of uh, um, um, poet, or you could say a, um, um, punk, early punk uh, um, and um, what he, what he um, for me, um, means is like, for me, it's c it becomes a kind of model or a kind of, of, of figure. And um, when, he, uh, when uh, he's doing uh, different practices, like he publishing newspapers, he, he did uh, poems, and uh, also he started a career, a short career as a, as a boxer, and they called him a kind of boxer poet. And he did also, um, uh, he had a, uh, um, he, he, he disappeared in, in, in it was a, a, a deserter, and he uh, goes to America and uh, and uh, want to move uh, to 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 South America, and he disappeared in a in a, in a sailboat. And I did an installation uh, of myself in a, in a sailboat as Andy Hope, you know. Also, this is a kind of. Uh, Biographical uh, thing where I grew up in uh, in Germany. Also, this you could see as a 
uh, what uh, kind of um, this is are the Rambo. I took this image for as a, also as a as a kind of um, reference for me to change identity. And this is a drawing. I call myself Andy Hope, the most colorful superhero of all. <laughs> so these are all settings was in the, in the sh in the show, you know. That what I, what this see you. And also there was some. I, I'm very was obsessed at this time with uh, with uh, Rochenko and uh, also with uh, the constructivist stuff at the same time. And uh, I saw the first time this kind of work, uh, it's called Stairway by, uh, by Alexander Rochenko. It, it, uh, it, it does this 1930, and I saw the first time 1930 as a number, you know. I uh, just forgot something to get back to this point. Um, sorry. Um, this, it's not visible, but this is on the drawing stands Dorian Hope. And Dorian, Ho Dorian Hope was the synonym of Arthur Craven. He wrote his essays and texts and, and poems under this synonym, Dorian Hope. And I used that by, to myself as a, as, a, as a synonym, and I did a kind of um, uh, a setting that me as Dorian Hope. So I called this time, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole installation was called Dorian Hope. And it was a kind of um, a fantasy biogra a biography, you know. <clears throat> And also this stuff was in this, all these uh, projects of modernism. Also this work was in the show. And uh, for me, the, um, um, this kind of crossover, like uh, I have to say a little bit, because the name of Andy Hope is not an idea of myself. So I'm not Andy Hope. But I call myself Andy Hope. But the idea of Andy Hope comes from, from the from outside, from my from my student colleagues. So, because they called me then later uh, Andy Andy Hope. So this is a kind of uh, strange accident because my name Andreas Hofer is kind of when you translate this to American, it's uh, exactly this Andy Andreas and Hope uh, Hofer. So it's and uh, then uh, yeah they called me Andy Hope and and then later on it took two another years, and then I took this as a, my signature. Um, and you see a kind of developing line, like I um, bring this kind of work, the, 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 the circle, in a way of uh, oval, like gravitation, time machine. This is a work what I did 2012. It's after this one. It's a variation of four different pieces. The Black Square of Malevich. And I took this decor or this graphic, this, this, this design from, uh, it's called Porter. It uh, is Planet of the Apes, and this is a kind of decor what they used in the setting as well. So, and I find this reference, and I bring this reference in uh, relation to uh, the constructivism of Malevich and Rochenko. This is a medley that says I repaint this painting 10 years later. It's this. I come later back to this idea of the medleys. This is a Rochenko work. And I uh, appropriate this work into my um, concepts. And the, the surrounding is uh, adaption from, uh, from Sophie Tauber up. And I just cut out uh, this kind of doubles and make it in, a, in this combination and bring it in a kind of frame about, uh, around the, the Rochenko. And you see also this kind of uh, distortion, it comes from the projection. 
So it's kind of this one is more rich in the way that in compared to this it comes this kind of more dynamic from this projection, from this perspective, from the light. You know? This is important because it becomes a, a different timeline as well. Um, this is called American abstraction. And also here comes uh, up the first time the idea to confront or to conflicting signs of constructivism <coughs> To, um, uh, to American pop culture. This called Project Survival is from a recent show at House on the Weird. And you see already on the right side, this is the original. And I did a kind of invention in, uh, or a kind of uh, um, um, marks in th into, this, into this work already and write on Black Hole Nightmare Hippie Cowboy. It's from 1998, and I repeat this work. And, uh, and the black hole has become this kind of sun, or it becomes this kind of positive energy. And it's a kind of uh, banner, or a, a kind of, of, uh, of uh, uh, headline for the whole show at House on the Weird in repeating my own, or appropriating my own work again. You know. Is another, uh, Robin Dostoevsky's here is another um, example for identity play. So this dress comes, for example, from Azedin Alaya. I, I, I borrowed this style of dress of him, from him. Also, I create this, uh, this sign. Robin, it's an R and a D. It's like a fragrance or so. It's a sculpture, it's uh, 2 meter 50 high to 50 centimeters and 180 wide. Now I come to this project, Batman Gallery. Um, originally uh, appears the Batman Gallery in the 60s, 1960, and you see this in the Bruce Corner, it was shown there. And it was very interesting to find this kind of Batman gallery in this, in this, uh, in, 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 in already in the context of um, comic thing, you know, and they, but they are only showed serious art shows there. Never showed them, uh, you know, things like from comic artists or so, very uh, a good gallery, I think. And I took over the, 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 the name to, uh, to bring it in my, in my cosmology. And I, for me, it was then uh, I create this kind of uh, gallery within a gallery, a gallery in a gallery, a movable gallery. It was by at Christine May in Munich. It's a small gallery, and uh, you see it's the the sign is uh, on light from 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 the ceiling. Here in the Goetz collection in Munich. And now in my recent show at House on the Weird as a kind of phantom or a kind of medley as well. So I, I, all, I also used um, the medley idea, what means I play on like in a, in a song or I make a, a combination or a re resemble stuff together, what normally doesn't fit together, and um, bring just new... Um, um, a, a new way of uh, abstract dimension up. It's like uh, they are isolated in his own space in a way. So they come. T they don't have this kind of uh, referential space anymore than the older work had. So I also use this kind of uh, um, installation f uh, concepts as well. So this is 2010 at the Metro Pictures Gallery. I showed these phantoms, paintings. These are all paintings, very subtle. 
only traces on it from, I paint this, uh, uh, I did this painting from an index, from a publication of mine called Phantom Gallery. It's first shown in 2007 in uh, Zurich and Los Angeles in the Sunset Boulevard. And this is my flat in Munich, my first flat. I shared this with a, with a, la with a landlady and I, we lived 10 years together. And she was a really messy, she has a really messy style flat. And I cut out this, this uh, image and I reproduced, re reproduced it on a, on, a, on a digital print. And you see the handle, the, 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 the door handle. So it's become a kind of transparent door. Well, it's part of the installation Erzhut Nie Wieselerie. And um, this is one room in the flat. So you, see, you can see the phantoms already on the wall. Well, but at this time, this was 1997 or 1996, uh, I had no idea about the IT, uh, or I, I just uh, saw the, the, the things, but I have a, a, any idea about how I can use it in my work, you know. This was my own flat. This was a repainted pre situation of a Malevich show in Petrograd, 1915, called uh, Zero Ten. And I called it New Suprematism. This was uh, another uh, shot of the flat. <laughs> and what I realized on this image, because this, uh, this light, I like the light, how, how, um, how it hangs and uh, how everything hangs a kind of on the, on the edge. But what I really like on the image is the, is, the, is the letter R. And I remember, because I really like Paul Klee, and I remember this painting of him, the Villa R, you know, you know, it's a very famous painting. And then I took over this Villa R composition, the sun, the, the moon and the R, in a painting and bring it in, in, the, in a complete different color on the black square on Malevich, you know. So, and you see, this is uh, also a preparation for my own, of, of our own drawing. You have to know, I, I, when I do these paintings, I, I, I use a projection, a light projection, not, not when I do the original things, you know. So this is a, a preparation of my own drawing, the, the cowboys, and they comes out from the depths of the black surface. So this is a way um, or a kind of new idea for me to see in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a surface or in a, in a black surface at, at, at a dimension of depth. This is the, the location of the Phantom Gallery again in Los Angeles on a Sunset Boulevard. And there was a surveillance camera inside and you could uh, watch the opening also in Zurich at the same time. It was a live video transmission. <clears throat> um, and also I like the idea to have this kind of uh, watching other society or things like this, you know. This was the transmission to in, in Zurich. And uh, the opening in Zurich, this was 8 o'clock in the evening and 11 o'clock in the morning. It was in LA, so it was just nine hours. And this is now in, in, uh, in the Phantom Gallery in, in, in Los Angeles. Is it? Uh, when you enter the space, it looks like this. So a lot of people thought the patches was already there, you know, so it's a left, it's a, the, the, somebody left a space like this. And originally the idea, when, I, when you remember the, the image from my flat in, in Munich, when I saw the, the phantoms the first time, originally the idea comes up again when I read a book called Crystal World from J.G. Ballard. You know, this author is a, is a very important author for in the 20th century, uh, especially for science fiction, but he also uh, wrote uh, Crash or Empire of the Sun. Uh, Steven Spielberg uh, did a movie on them. 
and there was, is a scene in it, and uh, a woman says to to Sanders, it's the the guy, he's in the, in in, the, in a noble. It's uh, we are. They they was in a house and they are walking around in an empty house, and she said, it's really really uh, scary. It's like we walking around in a phantom gallery, and then I suddenly remember this this point and 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 all these things and I and this I think this was the the point when I said okay I want to do this project and this was a quite expensive project it was m most expensive project what I did until until now <coughs> because we have to make from every real uh, thing a mask in wood and have to uh, do uh, experiments on uh, distance how the shapes comes exactly like it is in, in real, and also the mixture of the color is um, made in uh, the real stuff. It's like alchemy. It's like the tea, tabac. We, we, there's no color inside. It's just natural stuff. What really is in when you use a, a room over a, dec a decade or more, you know, and brings this trace and makes this trace visible from something what is unknown but brings this kind of abstract dimension and makes this visible and let this trace. This is a, a sculpture what I did in 2004. It's called Summoning. And it's a, it's a, to a talking clock and it's running. It's, and that, uh, when it runs, it's an optical illusion. The, the, the hands goes back a bit, you know, like it's like like it looks like it's the, the it's burning in the in this in this it's an optical illusion. A little bit you can compare this with the thing of Marcel Duchamp's circles and the tentacles from an octopus, is, and they are made in silicone. And we found this in a in a in a, in a flu market, this very or an antique store. And um, I saw this. It's also an appropriation from a from a horror comic, where I saw it, it in, and I took it up from a illustration, and I made it then after this illustration. This comes from a movie. I don't know which one. I f just found found this when I googled time traveling on on the, on the on the internet. Found this image, but I like this. They have this flat screen again, and ha have this. The steps in time only, you know. I think I really, I believe this really this on on this concept. So, I don't, I don't believe uh, space really exists in a way, you know. Only the space exists in time. <coughs> and this is the first time when I come up with the idea of with the time tubes. To. Um, so this was an idea when I actually was thinking about another idea or another work, and it comes up by accident, you know, just. And then I saw these things, in, and I uh, was, and I liked it from the beginning on because it was completely, um, I was completely into this depths of the, of the, of the, of the surface of the of the flat surface, of the right. Or like Malevich, or like the constructivist did, you know. This was the fir early first one in my studio. With uh, still made in cardboard. And these are the final ones made in MDF. And found frames or like flu market frames. Each has this individual char character, and each has this kind of. Um, Physio physiognomy, 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 you say, yeah, physiognomy, physiognomy. and a kind of uh, that comes up this idea of a of a being or something, you know, like a, like an animal with an abstract face. Also, they look like speaker, so it, it could be also go in this direction, but it also could take something from this dimension into another dimension. So also, they could uh, you could say these are portals. But in a way, um, I like them uh, in, in both ways. So for me, it's more a kind of uh, 
um, a portal in, 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 in works in two, two different ways. And also you find a lot of references in, 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 art, in, 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 in art history as well, like the invention of um, 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 perspective by Leonardo or the invention of the black square of, uh, of uh, Malevich. But they look really like when you when you stand in uh, really uh, uh, when you stand in front of them, they look really like screens. So a lot of people, when they are just four meters or three meters away, they still think they are uh, it's it's a painted black uh, flat screen on it, and it's much more black than a painted black. Painted black looks like gray. Mm. For me, it was always a fascinating thing because I really like. Uh, uh, Malevich and also I like Ed Reinhardt uh, a lot. This kind of uh, black or <coughs> to can absorb everything, every idea. And uh, in this show, in the last show when I shown the time tubes, is uh, I showed other, also this character called Half a Man. Um, it's interesting because this. I think Mike Kelly did a show called Half a Man too, but this uh, uh, is in the in the comic uh, Herbie, and you can find this character. So this is not uh, the I don't really invent many things in my work. So I, most things I found, and also this character I found uh, in a in a in a in a comic, and it's called originally Half a Man, and what I like on this character is this kind of blackness of the tubes, you know, in a body, of a, of a human body, to become this kind of dimension. So I'm not showing me meat and blood that many artists do, I just say a black, empty, hollow space, and it's infinity deep, you know, you can't see an end or something. No. Like this, you know, because the dimension of the of the of the of the work of, of the object, it doesn't matter. So it's it just stops after 250, so I bring the kind of a dimension, but in virtually virtually I mean that it goes far on, you know. And also this work, it's a very early work uh, from 2001. Uh, it's very hard to explain the title, Room uh, in the, that the night doesn't know and the day still broke on in a way. That is the, it's the translation, but it's very hard to translate the title of the, of the work. And, but you see the same constellation, you know, also on the black patches. But I did this work 2001, from 2001. So this is a kind of echo already on the time tubes before the sound was, I would say. Also, I took over this kind of, uh, of combination with this couple, what I uh, drawn from Francis Picabia. And I did several changes to the head. I bring, bring, bring the head and bring the mask from Spider-Man and uh, the, the, also the mask from Robin on, on, on her. This is the Kestner Gesellschaft in Hanover. And this space is called an Espaste Voyage. And um, it's a, it's a traveling room, and it's a kind of reference or alphabet of my work, and has a strong reference to Marcel Duchamp's uh, um, um, point. Boys and Falis, yes, sorry. <coughs> also, the big glass, and it's a kind of reproduction of re early works and references to my, uh, and also you see the time tubes and sculptures. 
also some comics as references. What very was very uh, had a, uh, it's a strong influence on me. And also these empty empty frames on the glass, and the perspectives. <laughs> then I want to show some um, uh, sources. One of the uh, important sources is uh, uh, Schwitters. It's a very late collage. What he uh, um, took over some comics and bring the, also this strange element in it, this white uh, white stripe. What is a complete uh, strange element in it? Bob Kane. This big Chuck Kirby. But you see already that comes up this kind of uh, of um, what I shown before this timeline between uh, when suprematism comes to an end or the constructivism comes to an end, and at the same time the superheroes, the invention of the superheroes, what was forced against or the side by side uh, on the evil forces in Europe, you know. They fight side by side, yeah. To show Schuster. Steve Titko cover. And I would say all this all these things are all also really you can find also in the art world as well, you know. Like in surrealism or in uh, for example what is very uh, matter. You know, matter like his kind of spaces what he creates, it reminds me really on on on, on spaces what Steve Kitko did, because he's really he was really uh, uh, strong in doing abstract abstract uh, uh, dimensions, to show abstract dimensions in a quite graphical or a liter uh, illustrative way. But this was also a, a strong influence, Ed Wood, the director, probably everybody knows them from the film Tim Burton movie with Johnny Depp. <laughs> no. This is a scene from Glenn or Glenda where he wa he's wearing uh, um, uh, women's clothes. This is a scene from nine, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And uh, yeah, this is, this is important because uh, Ed Wood is a kind of artist what is really hard to explain because he works from uh, intention what is outside of uh, artist strategy no, uh, normally I would say. You know? So he brings up uh, ideas long before uh, Jack Smith, for example, and Andy Warhol uh, bring up this, this kind of ch cheap productions and uh, queer cross-gender things already, and also this kind of make transparent the visual effects, like what later then um, uh, French uh, directors did. And so he was kind of preparing things for the avant-garde movie, I would say. But what is really strange on him is that you still can't not really say sure or say it's a good movie or not. And I like to uh, hide my own work in a way in this kind of, um, I don't know what it is, in a, to, you can't really decide what is in front of you. So, so I like to be, the work looks sometimes very naive or, or childish or uh, and bring up a kind of long list of theory behind it. Andy, should we let some, should we let everyone join in with a few questions here? Are you, are you ready? Yeah, just, just kind of two, just two minutes oh. still, yes. So this is, was installation. This is a kind of uh, other director, Roger Corman was kind of this legacy of Edward stands in his legacy. So this is uh, um, also this constructivist stuff. Again, if I borrowed these horns from the devil, that's called Devil's Son. 
And this is a medley of the devil's son. Black square with vampire teeth, <laughs> but could also read as a black, scree a black screen or black surface with a perspective. So you see, it's always this double meaning in it, like this more layers in language, you know? Also here, this is a kind of a medley. And I wrote a Batman gallery another one because it's become this Batman image when you turn around. And this is a collage of mine, uh, what is directly the model for Cardinal Julian for the sculpture. It comes from, uh, the sources comes from American pop culture, comics. And I let made this and uh, the head comes from UK, from a games workshop, from a, it's a toy company. The, 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 the face from my collage and the body from a Japanese toy, the horse. You know? So it's a kind of broken character. And it's ruled by fear itself, so it's accepts by back. This, the, 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 the installation is in a thousand, we are 2006. This is a medley again from a painting what was in the show. Um, these are now, now we are the, in the recent show uh, at, uh, at House and Wirt in London. I signed this painting with Francis Picabia and I took over the super realism and abstraction comes from my own painting. So I bring together with this Gerhard, pseudo Gerhard Richter background in a way and play around with this uh, kind of, he's working at the same time abstract at this in, in the same time figurative, figurative, figurative on, on, on photography. This is the character uh, Shroshach from Watchmen. Background is, comes also from a painting from Francis Picabia. Also, this outline comes from Francis Bicabe, and I wrote this unknown, like an unknown cloud, cloud of unknown, of, or unknowing. This I took over from, uh, is a crossover between Steve Ditko and an abstract painting of mine, abstract symbols, and it becomes a kind with the frame, like a, like a ethno Af uh, African or a African abstraction or ethno abstraction. I took this from a cover from Ed Wood, this women from the 50s, and bring all the kind of these dots and the frames. It's a repaint painting in the middle of mine, also the same constellation of dots outside, same decor. Also the, 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 all the surface is uh, done in an old way with, with lacquer. These are made from uh, flowers from Pitt Mondrian, and the uh, background are comic panels. What I just <coughs> using this um, Barbie and colors. Amazing, the shelf. Blend tech mixer, or a blender. What? Because I I use in painting the, the term blend tech several times as a technique, the blend, to blend. So it's, you see the repeating and the mix between the, stair, the stairs from the Batman gallery. Some were useless in the gallery. This is the whole show. The projection goes on the window to the side of the street and it uh, took over an old image from uh, a, a store what Marcel Duchamp did on the presentation of uh, André Breton in 1915, I believe. I'm not sure about the time now, but on the left is uh, the left the projection is the introduction of, uh, of the, um, um, uh, I forgot the name, um, Twilight Zone. And it's also a reference to this kind of surface of uh, spires to, to, to Duchamp. And it's a projection, yeah? It's, uh, 
And what I have to say to the projection, I forgot this, is uh, I did this in a way like Andy Wall did his screen tests. In three, uh, so they are exactly three minutes 50, and they are filmed in real time, and they are a little bit shaking, and they then are blurring off, and comes again after 350, and starts again new. And this was the book story what I did at Koenig with a book presentation in Berlin. It's also called Gossam Book. And everything in the window is black and white, like in the original image. <coughs> this is the original image. That's it. enough from us so I have lots of questions for Andy but I think you know if anyone has any questions from the floor let's uh, let's start with those when we've moved the lectern here so so warm it's hot isn't it yeah, I've been sweating like crazy I lost my mind a bit for heat So, any comments? I mean, you know, I do apologize. We've, we, we went on a lot, but you can see we didn't even hardly lay the groundwork out, you know, for getting inside of this extraordinary system, this cosmology that, that Andy's put together. I mean, I talked happily for half an hour or so and didn't even mention abstraction, right? So luckily we covered a good deal of that uh, in Andy's talk. But uh, yes, Sophie. Um, hello. Do I need the mic? Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what uh, What struck me? Um, I mean, I thought it was very interesting in the, the way in which you you each developed a whole world around the the uh, the actual works and a whole uh, constellation of uh, of references that went in very di different directions. But um, there was one other kind of constellation that really struck me, and I was thinking all the way um, all the time about the uh, well. A place that symbolizes it is the Ludwig Museum and the um, and the hanging, the display of the Ludwig Museum with all of this American art from the 60s. And what I've, you know, what what struck me is this: the way in which um, there's there's a tradition of German art being very interested in American art, the kind of Americanization of of uh, West Ger Western Germany in the 60s, 70s, um, and 80s. There's a big kind of tradition, with, you know, Kippenberger, Polka, and so forth. Um, these European artists, German artists, who were interested in American popular culture and brought it back into their work. And I was wondering to what extent that heritage and that constellation is something that's important for you or interesting for you, and what John thinks about it as well. So, that's that's for a both. German question, that's your <laughs> Do you mean a reference to, to this to this artist? Well, in a way, are you, do artist? you feel that you're, you know, in the footsteps of somebody like Kippenberger or Polka or that oh. whole, you know, um, oh. that whole German version of pop art right. that developed in the in the sixties? Yeah. I mean, I, r I recognize. I mean, Polka is, of course, it's a it's a it's a brilliant artist. I mean, what what say? I don't have to say something to Polka. He he's he's took over this these ideas of Francis Picabia, for example, the transparency and all, and this idea, and he comes with this social background from the east, you know, and and brought this up, and uh, I think he did it in his in his own way, in a, in a good way, you know, and I was like uh, new and revolutionary in, in the sixties when he when he did this the early stuff. I think later he becomes a kind of running out world, you know what I mean? And and to Kippenberger, I seriously, I, I, I recognized Kippen, uh, Kippenberger when I was already uh, finished the art school, you know, or in the end of the art school, but 
then I recognize him very strongly. And uh, I like his, his work very much. But I don't like his work so much when I was starting art, for example. I was more interested in American art and was not so much in German art. Maybe for me, uh, uh, always a strong influence was Blinke Palermo, for example. I liked him very much and his kind, his ideas of uh, economy, for example, the fabrics, what he used instead of to paint the stuff, you know what I mean? What he, what he did on American art and it was kind of, for me, was always a kind of guide to can do this, you know? Because I know, I'm aware about, I'm close to some American artists and my, the most of my subjects are in, um, on, on American pop culture. But in the end, I'm an, I'm an uh, European and I probably can't get, n lose this at all, you know what I mean? So, but uh, I see a chance to, to could make transparent things on, from my point of view, what also brings out interesting moments, you know what I mean? Or interesting from this European tradition to reflect this, for example, what I said, in the beginning, what I had a little bit problems to, to come into it is the kind of <coughs> the genis, genesis of Andy Hope, 1930. So, because it was a very complicated process. So, because it's uh, uh, the name comes actually like like the same way like Blinke Palermo comes to the name Blinke Palermo. Like he was he was uh, Schwarzkogler, his his real name. So, it's 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 hard to un to understand, uh, hard to imagine that you would say this is a Schwarzkogler painting, you know, from the from the from from the today, from a point of today, yeah? but it's his real name, you know. Or, or he has two names, like Hofferkamp too. Right? I think so. Hofferkamp and Schwarzkog, because <laughs> somebody had, uh, 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 was uh, uh, they adapted him. You know what I mean? Mm. And um, so this had a more stronger influ influence on a way because I was very into Ed Reinhardt in the beginning of my of my thing. I was very aware about American abstract abstr abstr uh, abstract expressionism and things. But I all also had this kind of strong feeling to go back in time to make this kind of strong references to, to, the, to the heroic uh, field of, of modernism, like Malevich, Polk, Lee, Kandinsky, or uh, Kurt Schmitters <coughs> and these people, you know. Also Sophie Tauber Arp. And uh, um, um, Sophie Tauber was very yeah. s uh, strong mm. influence also on me, you know. But when you, I mean, let's put the question another way. When you uh, write American abstraction on yes. an image where there are dinosaurs right. and <laughs> facetious <laughs> cowboys, right. what's going on? I mean, is American abstraction being disabused or caricatured? Is it some art world imperialism? Is it a kind of a joke? Is it, is it, I mean, what, uh, where is it between the dinosaur and the cowboy? In the, in the, in the, in the, in the combination with the, with the conceptualism or with, 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 with constructivism, you mean? No, no, I actually yeah. mean on its own uh, terms. I paint, I paint on a dinosaur like a, a black square and, and, or, or a cross okay. on a leg or something. So for me, it's, uh, you have to go back and have to see why constructivism is a, uh, I bring a connection to com from constructivism to, to comics, because the black of the printing and the black of the or of the, the simple, the simple flatness of the drawing, or a, you can say, you can see also the, the the black square as a sign, or as a drawing, you know, as a graphic design. In the end, it's a graphic design because the black square already exists before Malevich invented this as a painting. Huh. The only thing what uh, Malevich did is was the invention of the of this design what already exists. But black squares already exist long time before, you know. But this is not the thing, you know. So I think art was always about transferring or transform or from bring from one context to another context and bring a new value or a new visible thing on it. Hmm. You know? And for me the dinosaurs and the black square are the same art of runes in time when you go back. So I, I found, uh, I found a, a, a black square like a rune in, pa in the past, you know what I mean? Like, 
it, that's why, why that's why I changed my name. You know, this is the reason why I changed my name because as I'm not Andy Hope 1930, but I call myself Andy Hope 1930. You know, but in in this fictional character, I can do things what I can't do as Andreas Hofer, for example, because it's a fictional character. He can move and can go uh, virtual journeys. You know what I mean? So I go back in the real time and can continue things. But in real time, you know what I mean? Like in a virtual in a virtual way. So nineteen thirty for me is not so much a number in time, it's more or less a kind of portal. But to go like when you log in into a computer with your with your password and you get into the stream of the internet, you know. But it's if like if it, if it if you do take it in time, nineteen thirty, you would have been um, you know, twenty in <coughs> nineteen fifty, your character, Andy Hope. And so experiencing that whole, you know, popular culture of Americana of the fifties, the comic books, that's the kind of golden age that you're right. going back to. I mean, is there is there a kind of choice d does your interest in, in popular American popular culture focus on that era or does it go beyond it? Does it go to Contemporary popular culture, for example, of course, or yes, there's no there's no limit in this way, you know. But I I think it's not an uh, an accident that the 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 whole modernism breaks down and erased by this thing what happened in in Europe. This is really bad thing, and uh, the superheroes is the in, in the same time the rise of the superheroes in America. What I said, it's in they fight against the evil forces in Europe. Or they let, you know, and and they was a kind of. I play around with this, with this, with thi with this vocabulary, you know. I r make experiments with them, you know. No. Yeah. I mean, just uh, one thing was I have still to say is on 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 this thing is uh, still it's still important. For me, it's more radical to can still paint like Malevich, then to invite a style, he would be more look forward in technique. You know what I mean? Could you repeat that? <laughs> no, for me, I've, I found myself in a situation I could paint like this, in this way. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to, uh, most <coughs> things what happen today is a kind of um, painting become too much, um, um, what does this say, it's a, um, uh, um, El Greco, what, he, what, what, what you, what you say to El Greco when he was, uh, mannerismus. Man, okay. Yes, it's too, it becomes, you can say mannerismus in a good way like El Greco did, it's in a good way, but today think painting is in a hardcore crisis, but it already ends a long time ago, you know what I mean, but painting today, you have to be aware you can't paint anymore, but when you paint, when you do a painting, you have to aware all these aspects, what could mean painting today. I'm very really sure so about this, you know. So, but I, I paint by my, my, for myself in a, in a situation that I create my own context that allows me to paint like this. But normally it's not allowed, you know what I mean? So um, maybe my question ties in a little bit. First, uh, one small question. The, the work that you showed, the stay behind lines, right. lines and uh, was this an appropriated work or was this your character? It was my character. This one was not appropriated. Yeah. I, I'm curious in the appropriation. I wonder if does it, it appear more in your work after you became Andy Hope? Or were you always appropriating from the minute you were interested in art? I mean, I'm interested in the psychology of appropriation. As it, I, I find it from your presentation that it seems a bit comforting to have the context that you've created. And yeah. I'm wondering, is, is it about that psychological, is it about the comfort? I, or is it sort of, um, are you comfortable in that world when you're making the paintings in this, in this way? I feel, you, I feel comfortable, is it? Yeah. Okay, now I'm, I mean I select images what I could not really relate to something, you know what I mean? <coughs> like they have just a kind of unbestimmt, um, what is, sorry for this, unbestimmt, it's like not where you can loc locate yeah. the thing in a way. In like Yes, like this, you know. And then I appropriate this in a conflicting design with another sign. And 
And what you take away from my work is kind of conf conflict as well, because I let the space, a, a, a kind of gap between these two, two things, what you have to confront yourself in a way, too. You can could, could confront yourself in a way, you know? Like, for example, the sculpture with the Cardinal Julian, for example. There is just a multi-layered cultural things come together. For example, this is, you could call this the, uh, the surrounding of, of Germany. This is the look from outside to German history, in a way, you know what I mean? Like the idea, what they have, or the interpretation of this. And I took this kind of interpretation and create a new monster. But it's a broken character, you know? You saw this in a way, like, it's not, there stands not in a heroic way there, you know, anymore. It's like, it's ruled by fear, and it's ruled by this, I don't know how good the images was, but they have this kind of stone skin, and something breaks or it close, it's closing. So it's kind, quite in the middle. And you have, to, you have to, your own, you have to, you have to bring your own feelings and your own interpretation with into the work. I think it's part of the work that you bring your own, it le let this space. It's the gap between this side of the sculpture and the other side of the sculpture. But is there maybe to uh, follow up Tala's question, is there not in this appropriation some secret desire to appropriate the powers of the superheroes you paint? Even if they are broken, even if they are even if you paint them in a very flat way, even if you invent a kind of an image of an image which uh, induces more distance still, right. the, the obsession with the thematic is uh, makes me think you, wa you also want to symbolically um, appropriate some of the powers in uh, as an artist, as a painter, to right. can reinstall the painter as the heroic figure. Right. I mean, um, I think the, the, the heroes there is uh, not only heroes, there are only villains too, and mm -hmm. also villain uh, uh, heroes. They are just quite in the middle of to be just only he heroic. You know what I mean? There are also s Spider Woman. There is also Wonder Woman. A lot was my personal favorite favorite uh, 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 superhero is Wonder Woman. You know, <laughs> but I think uh, I'm not so. Identify with the with the heroes so much, you know what I mean? But just uh, bring up the heroes because they are a kind of have this social function in, in society, in a way, you know what I mean? Like an exit strategy, you know. And you see in the in the Greek mythology already, and they found their own way, like this desire. What you speak, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, I give it, I give the question back to you and say, maybe it's your own desire, and what you project into my heroes. It's a projection of you, you know. So I'm only the mirror what mirrors back what you wish, you know, mm -hmm. I would say. Because it exists in a society and it has a function in society. So what I shall bring up, it's only that what our artists can only do that what, what exists, I would say. And it's just the worst dreams, they exist, you know what I mean? And could be yours and could be mine. But I don't say I'm on the safe, on the, on the, on the good side, you know what I mean? It just, I'm in the middle of somewhere, you know. Mm. Found my pa path, but I don't think there's a, a good side and a bad side, you know. W would you therefore, I mean, this is kind mm. of interesting. This is, no, you know, just want to clear. Yeah, okay. But would you. Goya said in the end also that the painter is not only the hero, but also the culprit. So it's, it's, uh, it's also the villain. It's, uh, it's he, r he wrote it somewhere. Uh, in that sense, it's. I think it's very, there is a detour in order to become maybe very classical or very traditional in a certain sense. And it's not a critique, but it's just a remark. It's a, yeah. a, a, you, you organize a detour in order to become, to, to allow yourself to be very classic. In the way I'm working in a way. Yes, as, a, as in the it's idea exactly of the painter, the, exactly, yeah. the, I the mean painter I as I the I hero. I, do, I say it's very simple. I mean, you can, also, of course, you can also work like Wade Guyton, for example, mm -hmm. to bring this kind of technique on it. But then you find another problem later on. You know, not now. Now he's very successful, but maybe he 
become later now another problem. You know what I mean? So it is, was always this, this thing. Andy Warhol, in the end, he did classical painting. Like he, he called itself a Sunday painter. You know what I mean? This is not a critic on Wade Gardner. Just say, it, 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 it doesn't matter what you do. You know, the, the problem will come anyway. You know what I mean? So I, for me, it was interesting to want to do paint in this way, like Malevich did at this time. And I found uh, a kind of a setting that I can do this, you know? And that makes the, the work even stronger, not weaker, you know what I mean? But you have to understand the context, you know? In another way, do you, you have just a kind of, of view on the work that doesn't really touch the work or get the work, you know? Mm? I mean, these questions make me want to think a little bit more about the idea of identity and identification, which was brought up here just in one specific dimension. But I'm kind of, in, I'm, I'm feeling myself a little confused now about whether it could be said that your work is in fact staging promiscuous forms of cross-identification with all sorts of things, ranging from the Malevich Black Square, possibly through the superhero, through to certain moments, uh, circa 1930, that, that you prize and reference to really a large number of other things. So the point here is that the only measure of representation can be organized through this promiscuity, right? It's only possible because it's always looping somewhere else. Or whether, in fact, as you, I actually suspect you might now be saying, it's the opposite, that you don't wish to stake a claim in any form of identification, right? Not with A.H., not with Andy Hope or Andreas Hofer, who even appears right. inscribed in the image, not, as you've just said, uh, here to Philip, the, not with the superhero, maybe, not with, uh, not with any euphoric moment of modernist abstraction, not with any you know, response to the historical crisis of the 1930s and 40s, etc. Et so I'm, I, th there's my question. I'm wondering, do you over-identify or never identify? Or is it the wrong question? <laughs> Which, of course, is an option I didn't think about, but I'm sure you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, see what I'm saying, because there's lots of identification, right? right? There's lots of eager appropriation, lots of reference piled on reference. I mean, I talked about it in my talk, you talked in a very different way in your talk. Uh, but then in the end, is there really any left? I mean, uh, is it about the loss of the possibility of identification, but the need for representation to go on? Maybe, yeah. Hmm. Maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> is that optimistic or pessimistic? <laughs> <laughs> Just I mean, I mean, in the, uh, but I wouldn't get back to Andreas Hoppe anymore. You know what I mean? So it is sure. just the thing. What is really clear is that I, I, when I when I worked with as, as Andreas Hoffer, I found it, in a way, hard to get this kind of theory, you know, to can travel by it as a fictional character to sure. this place, to this place, and can take over there and, and be there. So it is much easier to speak about Andy Hope to speak about myself, you know what I mean? So this is a kind of third-person relationship. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, you could say that the stakes of your work is therefore about I mean representation not having any stakes, right? Not having any possibility to arbitrate something, but still being necessary. Arbitrary? To, to, to organize or arrange something. I mean, I, I sp I, the question seems to be circling back. I mean, several questions seem to be circling back to, you know, to this question of what, I guess just to put it very simply, what you might be said to put your faith in. To put my faith in? Yeah, because you seem like an artist who puts <laughs> his faith in something, I right. in a way, right. you know? Yes. It, uh, it strikes me. Yes. But then, when I ask myself that question, I realize I'm actually not very sure what you do put your faith in. And that, you know, maybe it is a sort of disquisition about that impossibility in some way. Maybe it is, yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions before we... Maybe just one or... Yeah, quickies. Little questions. Sure it's hard. It's a hard question. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll talk after this. I'm not sure about it. I understand the question completely. Yeah. Oh, I'll rephrase it after for you. 
Really? I'll, I'll just brief it again. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, I fir first time I saw your work was uh, 2007, this Jason Rhodes tribute. Okay. And it was this uh, epic crusade. Uh, and I was like, what is this work, 1930? Um, that's, you know what, uh, and then I found out, of course, that's not real. And I was like, what a dirty trick. Um, you know, uh, this alter ego thing. And then, yeah. of course, I mean, people always use alter egos, like Ray Pettibon's name. That's not his real name, you know? Um, but now we've come to this other side. You have Josh Smith, um, you know? And he's not hiding, or he's not um, going behind an alter ego. He's just writing his name. Uh, I mean, he draws fish and his name, you know? Really big. Um, I mean, I mean, I just find this as a, a, a kind of punc punctuation about this identity thing, where he's just going straight forward, like, that's me. Um, uh, versus, I mean, you're using it in a totally different way, maybe, but... I mean, I, I'm not sure about, I understand uh, uh, John, really, but I, I would like to say is Andy Hope could be also used as a label as well. It is a kind of answer. As so as for, as me, as for me, for me, Andy Hope, label. why I go... Uh, in the end, to end the hope, or why I decided was also a, a strong decision and a, a, a risky decision to work 10 years with a lot of publication with Andrea Sofa, and then uh, bring 2010 publications with Andy Hope. Uh, this is also a kind of risky thing, you know. But in the end, I, I, I would say Andy Hope could be seen as a project. So, and so, you so could both and become you could branding. Be, and you could be become Andy Hope as well when you become a, a, a part of the family. <laughs> <laughs> well, on to becoming part of the family. <coughs> Let's uh, thank Andy very much. It's great to see you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, John, very much. Thanks, Andy. Um, we can continue uh, conversations uh, with a drink downstairs in the canteen. So, all the way down. Follow the signs. Yeah. <laughs>